Welcome to HPX Daphne PT3. The first Hogsmeade visit came in late October, and Harry was quite anxious to get to the village. He'd written to Remus Lupin weeks ago regarding his predicament with Daphne, and Remus had sent a reply promising to come to talk with Harry face to face. Harry was hopeful that Remus might be able to provide answers into the mystery regarding the betrothal contract. Harry gave thought on the prospect of inviting Daphne Greengrass along. As she would have many questions herself. Yet, Harry decided against it, feeling that this conversation should be private as it was dealing with his parents. He was still very wary of the abrasive blonde girl and didn't want to give the Slytherins any more fuel for torment. As it was, Harry and Daphne had been avoiding each other over the past month. Harry had not once tried to talk to the pretty blonde, as he felt a sense of finality every time he glanced the pretty blonde. Daphne, in response, had turned her nose up at him every time she caught his eye. Harry felt his world was crumbling all around him as it was. He felt an intense pang of sad disappointment every time he glimpsed Ginny's fiery red hair. It was unfair that he had only recently begun to get to know Ron's sister, and even more so that she'd begun blossoming into an amazingly attractive woman. Harry hated more than anything that he'd not been given a choice. Along with the cursed prophecy hanging over his head, Harry was feeling like he had no choices left to make in his life at all. Like he was fate's plaything. So Harry had done all he could to distract himself. Firstly, he buried himself in studies. He had begun researching spells, hexes and curses that might aid him. He was beginning to suspect he wasn't going to learn battle techniques from Dumbledore, as the headmaster seemed intent on showing Harry the biography of the Dark Lord. So Harry, usually accompanied by Hermione could be found buried in spell books all over the castle or practicing new spells in an empty classroom. The other thing that kept Harry busy was the formation of a new Quidditch team. He had held tryouts the week before the Hogsmeade weekend, and had hated the entire process. Firstly, there had been an abundant number of first years, and people, mostly giggling girls. From other houses who had come down just to get Harry to notice them. Once he'd gotten everyone who wasn't truly interested in trying out for the team off the pitch, he had been able to finally set about tryouts. Even when he thought about it now, Harry was astonished that there were Hufflepuffs and even a few Ravenclaws out there to try out. The first portion of tryouts was dedicated to the Chasers. Katie Bell made the team easily. She was fast and she also had loads of experience. Ginny also made the team. Harry didn't want to include her as he knew he'd be seeing a lot of her, but he couldn't deny her speed and finesse in the air. She could actually outfly Katie. The chaser squad was round out by D. Melza Robbins, a fourth year who showed great skill handling the quaffle and amazingly quick thinking. For the beaters. Harry chose two very excellent fifth year in Jimmy Peaks, a third year, and Richie Coote, a fourth year. The two didn't quite have the flair of Fred and George, but the work extremely well together. Finally there was only the keeper position left. Harry was surprised to see that there were five people outside of Ron who wanted the spot. Harry watched as the candidates tried to show off their skills and felt a wave of embarrassment as four of the prospective keepers showed off their obvious lack of skill. In the end it came down to Ron, and a large, handsome-looking seventh year that Harry had met at Slughorn's get-together on the train. Cormac McClagan Both McClagan and Ron were tied, and Harry needed to put them through their paces again. Harry took a moment to speak to Ron before commencing the second tryout. Ron I know you are the best for this team. I know that you are an excellent keeper. Your problem is nerves. You need to believe you can do this. No one in this entire school knows this game or loves it more than you. I want you to think of the championship game from last year. I want you to remember how you kicked arse and helped us to win. I want you to play like that today, otherwise, I'm going to be stuck with McLagan, and I don't think I'd be able to ever forgive you for that. 
Got it? Harry swore he saw Ron's eyes grow fiery as the redhead stalled down to the goalposts. Harry had his new chasers trying every trick they could think of to get a goal on the potential keepers. He instructed them to not hold back anymore. He needed to know who the best of the two truly was. Harry gave a 10-shot limit for each keeper to prove their worth to him. Cormac went first. He blocked all but one shot out of 10, missing only against Ginny, who was the smallest and fastest of the chasers. Cormac kept a wry smile on his face as he swaggered across the field to stand next to Harry. Confident that Harry would choose him based on his performance and the fact they were old sluggies favorites. Ron got on his broom and flew up to cover the rings. Harry could see that Ron was psyching himself up. The redhead sat on his broom, shoulders back, eyes focused on the circling chasers. Harry gave a long look at Ron and gave a slight nudge of his head towards Cormac who was standing next to him, arms crossed, overconfident smile on his handsome face. Harry swore he saw Ron nod in understanding. It was a thing to see. Ron blocked everything. Even when Ginny tried to trick him by diving down to the ground and then shooting upward throwing the quaffle at the last minute. Ron kicked it down with ferocity. Ron used his entire body and his broom to block everything. He even almost fell off his broom at one point to block another of Ginny's shots. Harry couldn't help but smile when it was over. Cormac had been unable to argue with Harry's decision, and even begrudgingly shook Ron's hand in congratulations. Though Harry could have sworn he heard Cormac cursing as he walked away. Thanks Harry. Ron had said on the way to the locker room, smiling like a fool. You really got me fired up to do my best. Ron, I've seen you play at the burrow, and you're unstoppable. You need to get into a mindset that it's for fun. Forget the crowds, and just concentrate on the game and you'll be unbeatable. You really believe that? Ron asked surprised. You just proved it? How can you play like you just did and not believe it yourself? And it isn't just Quidditch. Harry said nodding towards Hermione who was walking back to the castle a little ways away. She waved to them and Ron waved back hesitantly. I think it's time you talk to her. Harry said. I don't know if I'm ready. Ron admitted as they continued on to the lockers. You've been working very hard on your class work, and you two haven't argued all month. She's noticed. She watches you all the time now. The worst thing that can happen is that she doesn't share your feelings. But isn't it unfair to not tell her? I guess so. I just don't know what I'd do if she rejected me. Ron shrugged. She'd never reject you. She'll always be your friend. If she doesn't share your feelings, I think Lavender Brown would happily take her place. Harry smiled just as Lavender and Parvati passed by. Watching the two boys and giggling. Both boys had noticed Lavender's growing flirtatious nature with the redhead boy. It had been a source of much conversation between the two boys, as neither knew what the proper course of action was. Even Seamus who was well known for his exploits with the female populace of the castle had tried to advise Ron on the situation. However, neither Ron nor Harry thought that just grabbing the voluptuous blonde Grafender and dragging her into a broom closet was the best option. The week passed slowly after that. He'd had another meeting with Dumbledore where he'd seen when Dumbledore himself had gone to speak with an 11-year-old Tom Riddle at an orphanage where the future Dark Lord had grown up. It was in those memories where he'd learned that Riddle had been a very cruel child. Especially to other children. Harry had noticed during the memory that Riddle had perked up when it was revealed that he was different. He seemed quite pleased to learn he was a wizard, that there was a reason behind all the strange thing he was able to do. Harry had also learned that Riddle had been a very independent child. He had refused an escort to go to Diagon Alley to get his school things. Harry also noticed during the memory that young Tom Riddle held a certain contempt for his name. When Dumbledore had mentioned Tom the bar owner at the Leaky Cauldron, young Riddle seemed to darken. When the memory had ended, 
Dumbledore pointed this moment out in particular. Even then, Voldemort hated anything that made him seem ordinary or suggested he might not be unique in any way. Even his name was a common one, and it deeply disturbed him. The headmaster had said that Harry had relayed all he'd learned with Hermione and Ron that night. Hermione reasoned that Dumbledore was showing the growth of cruelty that was Voldemort. They all seemed to ponder Voldemort's excitement at being different, unique. But that would change when he came to Hogwarts and he would find he wasn't really different. Hermione said. He'd be exactly like every other first year. That might actually explain a lot. Harry thought. But we know that he did everything he could to stand out, didn't he? He was head boy, after all. He won that award for special services to the school. But he framed Hagrid for that. Ron pointed out. But only Hagrid and Riddle knew that. And no one would believe Hagrid. Harry responded. No one had any idea what he really was. And I don't think anyone truly found out. He changed his name and I doubt anyone would put Tom Riddle and Voldemort together. That gave them all much to think about. All of that had been shoved to the back of his mind on the dawn of the first Hogsmeade visit. Answers were shortcoming. He was going to meet Remus Lupin at noon in the Three Broomsticks and Harry had so many questions plaguing him. He would be going alone, as he had asked Ron and Hermione to allow him to do this on his own. They had agreed knowing their friend would tell them everything later. Harry thought his two friends might actually have the talk, if Ron could only work up his nerve. Harry pushed the thought of Ron and Hermione together as his mind wandered to thoughts of Ginny. She arrived at breakfast in a pair of form-fitting jeans and a jumper that hugged her nicely. She was walking hand in hand with Dean Thomas, both smiling sweetly. Harry shoved his plate away as they passed and sat his head on his folded arms. I'm so sorry Harry. Hermione said sadly. Harry ignored her. He'd been becoming more and more depressed over his situation with every passing day. Harry. Have you even tried talking to Daphne? Hermione asked. No. Harry said coldly. Don't you think you should? I mean, it's not like you're alone in this. Hermione said her eyes focused on someone at the Slytherin table. Harry turned and saw Daphne sitting with her friend, Tracy. She was dressed for her own trip into the village, and though he was loath to admit it, Harry thought she was rather pretty. Harry harumphed and turned back to Hermione. You're being really stubborn, and rather mean. I'm sure she had other plans for her love life as well. What's been done is completely unfair, but the two of you should at least make an effort. What if you're missing something great? Hermione tried. Hermione, I really don't want to hear this. I'm sorry that you don't want to hear it, but you need to. Hermione said crossly. She looked at her friend intently. No one is denying that you've been dealt an horrible hand in your life but this time you could make it into something quite special if you just stop being so stubborn and close-minded. And what if you're wrong? Harry asked harshly. Then you're still just as unhappy as you are now, and nothing changes. Hermione pointed out. The point is, you have to try Harry. She's not going to come to you, and you're both stuck with each other. With that, Hermione got up from the table and left. Ron stared at Harry as if he wanted to say something, but thought better of it. After several moments he got up and left Harry alone. Harry watched Ron go, assuming he and Hermione were going down to the carriages. Harry turned to look at Dean and Ginny who were smiling and talking quietly to one another. Harry thought it might help if they weren't so damn happy together. He then turned to see Daphne Greengrass looking somewhat morosely back at him. Perhaps Hermione was right. After all, she was stuck in this whole stupid situation as well. Maybe he would talk to her. First, 
he wanted to know more about the contract. So Harry got up and headed down to the carriages that would take him to Hogsmeade, where hopefully there were some answers. At noon, Harry met Remus, who was waiting just inside the tavern. Remus paid for a private room and the two sat down have a long conversation. Your letter was intriguing, Harry. I must confess I was a bit surprised to learn you're our betrothed. Remus said concerned. You didn't know. Harry asked surprised. When you said you wanted to meet, I was prepared to yell at you for not telling me about it. Back up a bit. I never said I didn't know. Here's the thing, Harry. I knew there had been discussion while your mother was pregnant with you. I knew that your grandfather was in negotiations with Archibald Greengrass, but I did not know the extent of it. Your father mentioned that they were being pressured about the possibility of a marriage contract. After you were born, I never heard any more about it. I just assumed that the negotiations had fallen through. How did my mother feel about it? Your mother had many friends while in school, Aurora Somerset was one of her closest. Aurora married Cyrus Greengrass a year after they graduated Hogwarts. Your parents married soon after. I imagine your mother was very unhappy about the contract, but seeing as it was with the child of one of her greatest friends. I wish I could tell you something for sure here. Harry. What about my father? Harry asked bitterly. As I recall, he was very angry. He felt you should be free to make your own choices. He was already dealing with the threat of Voldemort, and this was before the prophecy, mind you. Your grandfather was a good man, but he was also very stubborn, like your father, and you as well. During the last months, I remember your father wouldn't speak to his father. Then a letter arrived that made him change his mind, but your grandfather had been killed by Death Eaters, searching for you. Remus said sadly. Do you know what the letter said? I don't. I'm sorry I can't be more helpful. Tell me, have you and Miss Greengrass spoken at all? Not really. She's different. I don't know how to explain it. She's abrasive and cold. Harry said, an odd look in his eye. And yet, you find yourself fascinated. Remus said, a small smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. Aurora Greengrass was an exceptionally attractive woman. It stands to reason that her daughter might be just as beautiful, and it would be natural for a 16-year-old boy to be entranced by an attractive young lady. But she's so angry, and blunt. And just so-so. Harry tried to articulate. Harry, have you considered the possibility that she is just as upset over the situation as you? I can't imagine anyone who would like their life mapped out for them, with no input of their own. But I'm not responsible for it. Why take it out on me? Harry protested. Perhaps because you are the only one she can take it out on. I doubt her parents would appreciate her to venting her true feelings over the matter. You are very lucky that you found out so early. Most of the time, two people trapped in a betrothal contract do not find out until just before they are wed. When it was common practice, there were a lot of bad marriages. It was not unheard of for a spouse to murder the other in order to be free. They would always end up in Azkaban of course but sometimes they preferred that. Oh that just makes me all warm and fuzzy inside. Harry sank in his seat. Harry shuddered as he tried to imagine any marriage that would be worse than the ever-present influence of the Dementors. Harry sank visibly at last, and he turned his heartbroken eyes to his father's only remaining friend. I like someone else, Remus. I only just started noticing her, and now I don't even get to have a chance. I'm sorry Harry, but perhaps this isn't bad. Sometimes, arranged marriage turned out better than a fairy tale. Spend some time with your betrothed, get to know her. You may find that she's all you wanted and more. Love doesn't just happen, 
Harry, it takes time and effort. You're starting to sound like Hermione. Harry grimaced. She is a very smart person, and a woman as well. You'd do well to listen to her. She does have unique insight into Miss Greengrass' perspective. Remus smiled. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? I heard you had some trouble on the train. Harry perked up and began to share all he theorized regarding Draco Malfoy. He related how he and Ron and Hermione had followed Malfoy into Nocturne Alley and overheard the conversation with Mr. Borgen. Remus listened carefully to everything, but his face showed much disbelief. Harry, you and Malfoy have been rivals since your first day at school. Do you think it is possible that you are overreacting a bit? Harry felt his anger rise. He took a deep breath to calm himself and then looked at his former teacher in the eye as he spoke very carefully. Yes. I admit it is very possible. It's highly likely. However, you should be asking yourself this, Remus, how many times have I had a suspicion similar to this that proved to be somewhat true? Remus sat back in his chair. He'd not expected that. It was true that Harry was often correct. His record alone showed that, and it also showed how he'd not told anyone before and how things had gotten out of hand. Remus had to admit, the boy was learning from his mistakes and trying to get help this time. I'm begging you, Remus. Someone has got to do something, investigate this as a real threat. I know it's ridiculous to think that Voldemort would mark Draco, but at the same time, who would suspect a sixth-year student? Ooh. All right. I will get with Tonks and we will look into it. I cannot promise anything will come of it. I'm only asking for you to trust me on this. Harry smiled finally. Satisfied that he'd gotten through to someone at last. They spent some more time talking. Remus enjoyed hearing about Harry's visit with Slughorn while Dumbledore had been seeking or recruit the potions Master Basque to teach. He also encouraged Harry to listen to Snape and try his very best in defense class. I know you hate the man, and perhaps your ire is justified. However the man has an astounding knowledge on the subject. You'd do well to listen to him in class. Harry promised he would and he promised Emus that he would think on the Daphne situation more openly. Daphne walked with Tracy through the streets of Hogsmeade. It was chilly, but not terribly cold for such an overcast day. A bit of time away from the castle pursuing one of her greatest loves, shopping was just the thing she needed. It had been an exhausting few weeks since she'd last spoken with Harry Potter. She had taken Tracy's advice and sent a letter to her grandmother hoping the elder woman might be able to give some explanation on the problem of the contract. But she had yet to receive a reply. This added to the growing feeling of impeding doom she felt in the pit of her stomach whenever she saw the raven-haired boy. She tried to put on a mask of indifference, but Tracy continually hounded her about speaking to the boy. It was becoming most vexing. But Tracy had promised not to mention the boy who lived that weekend so they could have some fun. The two girls had spent most of their morning perusing the shops in the little village, getting new quills and eyeing dresses in the clothing shops. Now they were hungry and decided to get a bite in the three broomsticks. As they entered, Daphne spotted Harry Potter following a disheveled man she thought she recognized up to the private rooms. She found herself a bit curious, but tried to brush it off as none of her business. Still, as she and Tracy made their way through their lunch, she found herself gazing at the staircase for any sign of the raven-haired boy to whom she was promised. Dot when they had finished their lunch and paid. They began gathering their things to leave when Harry emerged alone. Daphne couldn't figure out why, but she felt a need to speak to the boy. Tracy, I'll catch up to you, okay. Tracy looked wary until she spotted Potter and a knowing smile appeared. No problem. Go easy on the poor boy. She grinned. Oh, shut up. Daphne hissed as she left her friend to get close to the boy. Potter. She said by way of greeting. 
I think it's time we had a conversation. Harry turned to see the blonde slithering girl. Her eyes were piercing, but she didn't appear to be angry or upset. In fact, compared to all the other times he'd been with her, she seemed as if she was trying to be pleasant. I guess we should at that. Harry admitted grudgingly. Care for a walk? She asked. Not waiting for an answer. Harry followed her out of the tavern and into the chilly street. They walked silently for a bit, Daphne leading the way. Harry was beginning to wonder if he were being led into some kind of trap when they took the path heading back towards the castle. When they were just a little way along, Daphne turned off and went slightly into the woods, Harry following on her heels. Once they were just inside of the tree line, Daphne spun on her heel to face the suspicious looking boy. Don't worry, Potter, I'm not going to hurt you. It's not just you I'm worried about. Is there anyone else here waiting for us? Harry asked, eyeing the dark forest behind Daphne. Paranoid much? Daphne asked, raising an eyebrow. Wouldn't you be? He asked. Still not looking at her. I guess I see your point. But right now, you're safe. I swear it. Harry finally looked at her. She looked at him for a long moment before finally heaving a great sigh. The way I see it, we're stuck with each other. Though I'm loath to admit it, it could have been far worse. Thank you, I think. Harry said flatly. At this point, we have only one option and that is to begin getting to know one another. After all, we're going to be married, and I think it would be beneficial to know something about each other. So I propose that we choose a night of the week to get together in private so we can ask questions. Some place away from prying eyes where we can not be interrupted or found out. I think the last thing either of us want is for this to get out to the public. Harry thought about Daphne's proposal, scrutinizing it. He couldn't find any flaw in her logic, especially the part about their situation getting out. He nodded slowly. He stared at her for several moments, trying to decide how best to proceed. He didn't want to appear weak in front of her. The last thing he needed was to show any kind of vulnerability that she could expose later on. All right. Harry finally said. That seems agreeable. You choose the night, but I get to choose the place. Daphne hesitated for a moment, but finally said, agreed. Let's say Wednesday evening at 7. That should be fine. Go to the seventh floor corridor in front of the painting of Barnubu's The Barmy. I'll meet you there. They both nodded at one another and then, strangely enough, neither moved. There was an awkward silence as they simply stared at each other. Finally Harry gave a sort of wave and backed away, peering behind Daphne. Daphne simply felt a bit of relief that nothing had happened. Once Harry was out of her sight, she began making her way back up to the castle. She had done it. She had made her first meeting with Potter. She had a lot to do now. She would have to come up with a way to discern the truth in his answers. She knew Harry to be somewhat private, and it was doubtful that he would just offer up information. Not only that, but they needed a way to trust one another. Daphne had always had trouble in trusting people in general. Five years in Slytherin had made her very wary of people, as everyone seemed to have their own agendas. Not that Daphne was completely innocent of manipulation and deviousness. But it seemed as though most of those in the house came from families that had impressed the importance of strong allegiances, and how best to forge them. Even some first years seemed wise beyond their years in the art of manipulation. Daphne's situation called for a more direct action. Something that would show Potter that she was different. She knew he would never trust her outright. Nor was she just going to put her faith in him right away without some evidence that he was worth it. The more she thought of it, the more difficult the situation seemed to become. This was going to take some serious thought perhaps even a conversation with someone else. 
someone who knew Potter and might be able to enlighten her in ways to put the boy's mind at ease. Daphne felt her shoulders sag at the one person she knew could help. Daphne was going to have to speak to Hermione Granger. Why are you being so stubborn about this? The boy will generate some much needed morale. Rufus Scrimgeier shouted. He was standing across from Albus Dumbledore in the headmaster's office. This was the fourth time the new Minister of Magic had come calling, and it was the fourth time he had requested to speak with Harry Potter. The new Minister of Magic was a tall slender man with long shaggy hair and bright hazel eyes. His face was lined with several scars he'd received as an auror, and his mouth was a perpetual scowl. Though he was in his fifties, the man still looked quite young, though the stresses of his office were beginning to show, as his light brown hair was graying considerably. Rufus, as much as I appreciate what you are trying to do for our people, your methods are little better than a puppet master. Dumbledore said calmly. Oh ho! This from the grandest puppet master of them all. Scrimgeier said irritably. Don't think I'm blind to what's going on. Enlighten me, if you please. Dumbledore said. You've got the boy eating out of your hand. He'll do whatever you tell him, so long as he believes it's for your so-called greater good. And don't you dare deny that you are the leader of this phoenix business. I know that some of your people are in my law enforcement. I know you kept us from capturing Black all that time. People are dying, Albus. We need every little bit of help we can get. If the people believe that Harry Potter is helping us, supporting the Ministry, we might be able to save the situation. The situation cannot be saved by mere photographs and articles in the Daily Prophet as I have told you before. Something must be done, real punishments must be handed out. You would get just as much support from the public if you actually caught real Death Eaters. This isn't a game Dumbledore. I agree. It is not. You have several Death Eaters in your custody. I believe you should be having chats with them, with Veritaserum, and then dole out appropriate punishments, and I do not mean lifetime sentences in Azkaban. We've already been shown that the Dark Lord can go in any time he likes and free whomever he chooses. We must thin their numbers, Rufus. Harry Potter is not going to help you with that. I think you will find his opinion of his government is very disheartening. You're talking about executions. Call it whatever you like, but the fact remains Voldemort has too many people on his side, and we have far too many people who are too afraid to rise against him. Perhaps with a few, executions as you so eloquently put it, you might get the morale boost you so greatly desire. Fine. Scrimgeier said plainly disgusted with how the conversation had gone. Play this game, Dumbledore. Allow more people to die. Keep your damned secrets, but I promise you, it will be the end of us all. Rufus Scrimgeier fastened his cloak tightly and went to the fireplace. I will speak with the boy, one way or another, Dumbledore. I'm afraid his answer would be the same as I have told you. Rufus Scrimgeier glared at the old man before stepping into the flue and disappearing in a flash of green flame. Dumbledore sighed wearily once the Minister of Magic had gone. He looked at the new edition of the Daily Prophet that had been delivered by the Minister. The front page was emblazoned with the headline. Seventeen Muggles Kissed in Bristol Dementors on the Move Dumbledore knew he was running out of time. He wanted very much to work with the new minister, but all Scrimgeier wanted was something akin to Fudge's Band-Aid-like solution. Dumbledore knew that simply parading young Harry Potter around in front of photographers was not going to alleviate the wizarding world's problem. Voldemort was elevating his attacks, and there was no one willing to do what it took to stop him, save a 16-year-old boy who was not yet ready to face his destiny. Over the next few days, Daphne felt a growing sense of dread. On more than one occasion, she thought of cancelling her looming rendezvous with Harry Potter. 
In her mind, Daphne thought of hundreds of scenarios. But she was so nervous and suspicious of Potter, that everything she imagined ended with hexes. Tracy had been helping her compile a very long list of questions in which to ask the boy once he and Daphne were alone. But one thing weighed heavily on Daphne's mind. How would she be able to trust anything that Potter told her, or convince him that she herself was being honest? Daphne could only think of one way to ensure complete honesty. But seeing as she would be very unlikely to get her hands on a couple of vials of Verita serum, she was lost for any other ways in which she could ensure their honesty with one another. Daphne already had the answer to her problem, and it came in the form of a bushy-haired grapefender bookworm in ancient runes the morning of her meeting with Potter. Daphne happened to look up from her book just as Hermione stepped in the door for class. She quickly got up and gathered her things. Tracy looked up, but before she could ask, Daphne had sat down next to Granger. Tracy hid a smile and went back to reading her own book. Granger, I need your... Daphne seemed to cringe a bit. Advice. Hermione looked up at Daphne, a bit of surprise on her face, but there was something else there too. A look of anticipation. It was as if the intelligent witch had been expecting Daphne to speak to her. I will help as best I can. Hermione said softly. I'm assuming that you already know about my situation with your friend, Potter. Hermione nodded, her face calm and slightly sympathetic. We have a lot of things to talk about, he and I, and I don't know how that is, how can I? Trust anything he says. Hermione ventured. Yes. Thank you. Daphne sighed heavily. I think you'll find that this isn't the only thing the two of you have in common, once you begin talking, that is. But that isn't important now. Harry isn't going to just open up his life to you. He really distrusts anyone from Slytherin, a prejudice that you're going to have to overcome. Are you suggesting that I simply open up to him? Allow him to learn my deepest secrets? No. He has to earn your trust as well. It would be very unfair to give him so much and not get anything in return. I would suggest starting small. I know it sounds silly, but keep it simple, favorite color, food, broom type. Don't rush things, or he'll clam up. Perhaps with time, he may trust you with things he's never said to me. You don't know everything there is to know about him. Daphne hissed in astonishment. Harry is a very private person. And as I said, you can't just outright ask him. There's a lot he's ashamed of, things I've guessed at. Like what? It isn't my place to tell you. Hermione scowled, protective of her friend's privacy. I'm sorry. These are things I should be asking him. But how can I show him that I'm being honest? I don't have an answer for you. I wish I did. You're just going to have to be patient and let trust build over time. Or you could swear an oath, I suppose. An oath. Daphne slapped her head. So it was that Daphne made her way to the seventh floor just before seven in the evening. She had thought hard all day about her conversation with Hermione and what she might ask of Potter, who was nowhere to be seen. She shook her head as she thought how she more or less expected Potter to back out of their meeting. She stopped at the portrait of Barnubu's the Barmy and looked all about. She checked her watch and saw there was still one minute left until seven. Daphne took a long calming breath trying to settle her nerves. She had thought of little else today, especially after her conversation with Granger. Daphne had been correct in approaching Potter's friend first. Granger had provided a good foundation in which Daphne could build upon. She had already figured it would be best to keep this first rendezvous as simple as possible. There was no need to go in with her claws out. There were footsteps behind her, and Daphne whirled to see nothing. 
she looked down the hall and could see no one. The she noticed a door that had not been there only a moment before. The door opened of its own accord and Daphne let out a squeak of fright when Harry Potter's head appeared out of thin air. Come in. He said softly, motioning his head toward the open door. Daphne's eyes narrowed at the boy's head and walked as dignified as she could pass. The door closed and Daphne found herself in a comfortable looking room with two large squashy chairs and a warm crackling fire. Daphne turned to see Harry, his body visible now, and a shimmering, silvery cloak over his arm. Is this the room of requirement? She asked. Yes. Harry said simply. This is where you trained all those people last year? I thought his would be bigger she said unimpressed. It can be. It becomes whatever you need it to be. Right now, I needed a comfortable private place where two people could have a conversation. How does it work? Daphne asked unable to stifle her curiosity. She looked to Harry who was watching her carefully. You simply walk in front of the wall, thinking of what you need three times, and the room appears. Shall we sit down, or would you prefer standing? Daphne took another moment to look about at the room. It was actually quite comfortable looking. Had it been a bit bigger and loaded with bookshelves, it might have been the library back home. Daphne had to admit she was impressed with Potter's taste in comfortable rooms. When she took her seat, she had noticed that Harry had already seated himself, both feet firmly planted flat on the floor, and his hands folded in his lap. He was watching her carefully. She suspected he was trying to spot a hint of deception in her. She couldn't really blame him at this point. He was clearly expecting to be attacked, and Daphne realized she had a substantial amount of hurdles to get over with Potter. We have a problem, Potter she spoke plainly. I'm quite aware of. Harry began. No I mean besides the contract. Daphne said. We have a trust issue. I can't trust you, nor can you trust me. Our prejudices and our pride prevents us from believing anything the other person says. Am I correct? You are. So how do we overcome this? We have two options. Blind faith, in which we simply make the leap that the other is speaking honestly, and will keep the discussions to themselves, or we make a magical oath. An oath. As I said, we have only these two options, unless of course, you know how to brew Veritas Serum. It's an interesting proposition. As I don't have any ideas of my own, I guess a magical oath would be suitable. Good. Daphne said satisfied. She pulled out her wand and clutched it with both hands. She surprised to see that Harry had his wand out so fast. She hadn't even noticed him pull it out. I swear upon my magic that I will not attempt to do harm to Harry Potter and will answer any question honestly for the next hour. There was a slight blue light around Daphne, which faded quickly. Harry looked impressed and repeated her actions and words. When the light faded, Daphne set her wand upon the small table in between them. She sat back easily, crossed her legs delicately and breathed a little easier. What would you like to know? Harry asked as he too set his wand in plain sight. Well, I thought we might start simply. When is your birthday? Harry actually grinned at this. July the 31 st. Daphne actually liked Potter's smile. It was easy, and striking. A far better look for the boy who seemed to be constantly scowling or brooding. Mine is August 19 th. Daphne said evenly. I expect presents from you now. We are engaged after all. Harry gave a little chuckle. He looked at Daphne for a moment. I never would have guessed you had a sense of humor. Why would you think that? Daphne asked curiously. Well, word around the castle is that you're a bit cold to people. 
That is true. They all call me the Ice Queen. It is a way to keep unwanted people away from me. Don't you care what people say behind your back? Harry asked. Do you? You should know better than anyone that people will say whatever they like, no matter what you do. If they believe something about you, there's little you can do to change their opinion of you. I suppose you're right. Harry said thoughtfully. I do get irritated when people are talking about me, especially when they're spreading rumors, but there's never anything I can do. Exactly. Why waste time worrying what the populace thinks when it only matters what you think about yourself? I came up with the persona of the Ice Queen to keep away people who were of no use to me. Especially boys. Most boys just see my physical appearance and don't care for anything else. It's gotten worse with every year, but they keep their distance at least. A well thought out plan. Harry admitted. Not entirely. It's made dating difficult. Any boy that I felt was worthy of my attentions was too afraid of me. Daphne felt suddenly self-conscious. She had not meant to reveal so much, but somehow it had just come out. She needed to even things. What about you? Word has it you and Cho Chang were pretty heavy last year. You believe everything you hear. Part of why I'm asking. Daphne said, crossing her arms. Truth is it wasn't meant to be. I don't think she was ever truly interested in me. I think she was seeking some kind of closure over her and Cedric Diggory's. Harry trailed off. Daphne saw something in Harry's eyes. A sort of guilt. Daphne couldn't think of why Harry might be feeling guilt, but thought best not to ask. May I ask what happened? She asked Harry. I mean how it ended. She thought I was interested in Hermione and kind of fell apart. She wouldn't give me a chance to explain. Harry shrugged. I kind of figured out later that she wasn't truly interested in me. I never thought of that. Daphne said, more to herself. What's that? Oh. I just never really thought about someone not being truly interested in you. You're the boy who lived. The chosen one. It never occurred to me that there's more to you, or rather forgive me for saying less to you than that. No one really does. As you said, people think what they like, no matter what we do to change their minds. There aren't many people here who know who Harry Potter really is. Harry said softly. The pain in his eyes was clear, even to Daphne. His reputation was nothing to him. I never wanted fame, contrary to what you might have heard. I'm not some attention-seeking miscreant. If that's who you were hoping I'd be, I'm sorry to say that person doesn't exist. That's good. Daphne said after several moments. I have no interest in the boy who lived. I'm not one of those simpering fangirls who huddle in classrooms talking about how cute you are, or how amazing you are. To me, Potter, your fame means nothing. Harry gave another small smile that Daphne could not ignore. She found herself giving her own little smile, and silence fell between them. She had to give the boy credit. She had expected some kind of egomaniac or haughty celebrity type similar to Lockhart, but the boy before her was nothing like that. She couldn't figure out why she ever believed him to be that way. Perhaps it was the years of hearing Malfoy preach to all who would listen about the vile ways by which Potter used his fame to his advantage. But that had changed during the course of their conversation. She was beginning to see something deeper than the facade the public idolized. Harry Potter was something else. Something Daphne could not yet identify. Daphne's watch read that it was after eight now. She stood up, smoothing the front of her skirt. Harry stood as well. Well, Daphne said. For our first meeting, I think this went rather well. Shall we say the same time next week, Potter? 
That will be fine. I will see you here next week then. Harry nodded. Good. And next time, if you sneak up on me we'll be having our conversation in the hospital wing. She gave a wicked little smirk and sauntered out of the room of requirement. Harry once again found himself watching the sway of the blonde Slytherin's hips as she walked away. Well, that could have gone worse, I suppose. Harry thought to himself as he donned the invisibility cloak. So how did it go? Tracy asked excitedly when Daphne returned. The two girls went straight for their dorm to get away from prying ears, and were sitting on Daphne's bed. Fine. He answered everything I asked. Well, what did you ask? Tracy asked, leaning forward excitedly. I know you want to know every little detail, but don't you think it's private? You know, something just between us. I doubt you two got into that deep a conversation. Tracy remarked, giving her friend a look of disbelief. For your information, no we didn't. But that doesn't mean I'm going to tell you everything that happened. Suffice to say that for our first real encounter, he impressed me. That's all you need to know. You really are horrible to do this to me. I'm your best friend. Yes, and as such you should respect my privacy. This difficult enough without you prying into it. Fine. But promise me you'll tell me stuff eventually. Oh fine. Daphne sighed. I'm going to bed now. Daphne changed into her sleepwear, which was little or than a think tank top and some shorts. She went through her nightly ritual, brushing her teeth and washing her face before finally slipping under her warm blankets. Yet she found sleep elusive. Every time she closed her eyes she saw Potter staring back at her. He was sitting in the same chair he had been earlier in the evening, smiling at her. She liked how his easy smirk lit up his emerald eyes. She found him confident, not cocky, as she had expected. He was obviously uneasy, but she had not given him any reason to let his guard down. She had been surprised at how candid he'd been while they spoke. To hear him talk about the fiasco that was Cho Chang was surprising. She had not expected him to talk about something like that, at least not in their first encounter. Daphne suspected that Potter might be angry at himself for spilling too much. But he hadn't been the only one. Daphne had felt she'd divulged too much as well. But she had done a decisively good job at keeping the conversation center on him. She would have to be careful next time. Potter would surely try to focus on her. Harry lay down heavily on his bed. It had been an enlightening evening. Though, he had admittedly learned very little about his future bride. Still, the girl had sworn a magical oath just to put him at ease and then rested her wand in plain sight. It was an amazing show of faith as Harry could have not taken the oath. He thought back through the evening. Ha had donned his invisibility cloak and gone up to await Daphne's arrival. She had come alone, and stared at the portrait waiting for Harry to arrive. It had given him the chance to see if she were setting him up. When nothing happened, and she began to look impatient, Harry had begun thinking of a room where they could be alone, and comfortable. Daphne had nearly jumped out of her skin when Harry had thrown the cloak off his head. He had found it a bit comical the way she had tried to act as if she hadn't been startled. He watched her very carefully as she examined the room of requirement. He knew that she would enjoy it, and was happy to enlighten her in how to use the room. After all, Harry had no claim on the room, and there were plenty of places where he could secret himself away without fear of being disturbed. Somehow he thought Daphne didn't know the castle quite as well as he did. The conversation itself was actually pleasant. Daphne had been very forthcoming with her answers, though he was aware the conversation had been focused on him. He would have to be aware of that next time, and try to learn more about her. 
he was also a little stunned by her sense of humor. Daphne had joked about expecting presents now that he knew her birthday. She had made him chuckle, which seemed to be a hard thing to do these days but she had done it with a trifle of a joke. Were it not for the fact she was in Slytherin, perhaps they might have been friends all this time. For the first time in several months, it was not Ginny's face Harry thought of when he fell into sleep. Harry awoke the next morning quite confused. He got showered and dressed and joined Ron and Hermione for breakfast. As he ate in silence, he thought about his encounter with Daphne from the previous evening. When he'd gone to sleep, he had not thought of Ginny, as he had since late July, when he'd arrived at the Weasleys' home. At that moment, Ginny walked in the Great Hall, escorted by Dean Thomas as always. Harry watched them pass and even returned Ginny's little wave. Something felt different now. He felt, conflicted, undecided. Harry wondered if it was a result of the contract. Hermione, is it possible that the marriage contract could influence my emotions? Hermione looked up a little oddly at her friend. I don't think so. Why do you ask? Ron looked up from his plate, mouth bulging with eggs. Was at? He mumbled through the food. It's just, well I feel different. Confused. Harry admitted, his face burning. Hermione glanced down the table to where Dean and Ginny sat with some of Ginny's friends, and a knowing smile began forming. I take it your night went well with green grass. She asked slyly. You met with the Slytherin? Ron asked incredulously. I thought you were with Dumbledore or something. Yes, I met with Daphne, and how is it any of your concern? Harry asked angrily. That's not how you're going to win over Ginny. Ron, in case you haven't noticed, Ginny's with Dean. Besides, Harry's betrothed. Hermione began. Shut it. Harry hissed loudly. Several heads turned to stare at the three friends, who tried to pretend there was nothing going on. Look, I went to talk with Daphne. It's really none of your business Harry whispered. What if she gets Malfoy or some of the other snakes? Who's going to have your back? Ron asked sourly. I can take care of myself, you know. I don't need a babysitter. Harry said venomously. He got up and stormed out of the great hall. I'm just trying to look out for him. Ron said a little angrily. Ron, Harry has got a lot to deal with. Can you even imagine what it would be like to not be with who you wanted to because your parents made other arrangements? Hermione asked, staring at the doors Harry had just left through. Ron looked at her then. He could feel a warmth spread in him that he always felt when he really looked at Hermione. He wanted to reach out and take her hand in his and tell her everything he'd been feeling since fourth year when he'd begun to realize what was happening. But he didn't. Instead he took a breath and pushed it all down inside. There was no way someone as great as Hermione would ever return his feelings. She was too brilliant, too gorgeous. She was far more than he deserved. How could she ever see him in the same way that he saw her? He had been trying very hard this year. He was studying much harder, and he was constantly biting his tongue just to avoid arguing with her. Yet, he just couldn't bring himself to admit to her how he felt. Ron simply couldn't bear the rejection. So he kept his feelings to himself, and tried to pretend it was nothing. He couldn't bear the thought of losing Hermione's friendship. She was much too important to him to risk losing over some silly feelings. All right everyone, good practice. Harry said to his team as they touched down after practice. I think we're going to do really well this Saturday. That's it. Get a shower and some rest. He said dismissing them. The team began heading up to the locker rooms when Harry had a sudden urge. He couldn't explain it, 
he just knew he had to act. Ginny, could you hold back a minute? The redhead fifth year turned and gave a sweet smile that made Harry quiver. Sure Harry. I I wanted to ask, that is, I. Harry stammered. What is it Harry? Ginny asked, growing concerned. Harry sighed and ran his hand through his already messy hair. He hadn't know what had come over him, but now he wished he'd not said anything and let her go. She stared at him with her bright blue eyes, a look of worry on her face. Harry had no choice. I know this is embarrassing, but I have to ask, how serious are you and Dean? Ginny's expression hardened instantly. Did Ron put you up to this? I'll hex his bits off. Ginny said preparing to march up to the locker rooms. No. I'm asking. Harry said, reaching out to hold the angry redhead back. I'm asking for me. Ginny stopped dead and turned back to look at Harry. His cheeks could have lit up the night with as red as they were. He was staring at the ground and nervously shuffling his feet. Wow. Was all Ginny could say. Yeah. You know what, just forget I asked anything. I don't know why I did. Harry, you have no idea how I wanted to hear you say that. If it had been last year, I would have thrown you to he ground and snogged you until you couldn't see straight. But a lot has changed. You've no idea, Harry thought. I got to truly see you last year. I was able to put aside my ridiculous idea of who you were and really see you, Harry. I think you wonderful, and any girl would be lucky to have you. But that girl isn't me. I've grown up, and my feelings for you have changed, Harry. Harry felt strange. He had never expected to hear this from Ginny. It was widely remarked on how Ginny felt about him. Or rather, had felt about him. He didn't know what he had expected, but this hadn't been it. I'm sorry, Harry. I just don't feel like that about you anymore. I'm so very sorry. It's okay Ginny. Really. To be honest, it never would have worked out, but I needed to hear it. Ginny looked taken aback. If it wouldn't have worked out, why did you ask about me and Dean? I'd like to tell you, but I don't know if you'd believe it. In fact, I don't believe it, but it's happening. Harry, we're friends. That's not going to change. You've become one of my greatest friends. I thought you knew you could trust me. You did share the prophecy with me. I suppose you're right. Okay. Here goes. And Harry began to fill Ginny in on everything, from his growing feelings for her, right down to the betrothal contract though he did leave Daphne's name out of it. Ginny remained calm, though she came close to tears as Harry revealed how he'd been feeling for her. She couldn't help wishing it had come one year earlier, but she had matured, and her childish crush on the great Harry Potter had fallen away as she had begun dating other boys. It was through those experiences that helped her chip away the rose-colored image of Harry and see who he truly was. As it fell away, she became more comfortable around him and they had been able to speak and truly become friends. And then one day her crush was gone. Her romantic feelings were replaced by more family-like emotions. He had become another brother, one that she proudly stood beside in the Department of Mysteries. Ginny Weasley's dream of marrying Harry Potter had evaporated into nothingness. When did you learn of the contract? Ginny asked, trying to brush aside the morning of her childhood. On the train. It's pretty much unbreakable. Oh, Harry I can't imagine what you're going through. Is she at least nice? I don't really know that yet. We've only just begun getting to know each other. He admitted. Is she pretty? Ginny asked slyly, nudging Harry with her shoulder. Yeah, she is. I guess I got lucky there. 
Well, I suggest you let her see the real Harry Potter. I know things are really screwed up for you, but you can make this into whatever you want it to be. You have to decide. Do all girls believe in the fairy tale ending? Harry asked chagrined. It's our nature to believe in the power of love, Harry. Contrary to what you might believe, there is truly no magic stronger. You just have to open up your heart and believe it's possible. With that, Ginny Weasley went into the girls' locker room. Harry stared at the door for a moment before going into the boys' locker room. As he changed he thought about everything Ginny had said. Her feelings had changed, and she was no longer interested in him. It had hurt to hear, but Harry knew that he needed to hear it, and needed her to say it. Harry was unsure why, but he had a strange feeling that something was about to happen. Hope you enjoyed please like and subscribe.